No, 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 no more question. <sighs> Welcome back to Psychonauts 2. Let's talk about the stuff that happens between missions. How do they keep you entertained while you're wandering around the world? Got to work. One of these ways is to give you these cornerstone dialogues. Need any help, Sasha? Yes, from him. Me? Help me find the answers I need. Oh, so this is all my fault. So having these kinds of dialogue trees with cornerstone characters is a classic. It's a way to interrupt the normal, you know, widget hunting of uh, open world exploration with something a little bit different. It happens in virtually every game like this. Uh, for example, Paradise Killer does this too. However, this game has a couple of unusual rules. These are strictly optional, so that means that you never learn anything during these conversations. All of these dialogue options remind you of things you already know instead. Because of that, they focus on advancing the characters. They focus on making sure that you feel like you're bonding with the people you're talking to. Watch. He's going to remind us that moles exist, or a mole exists. Have any suspicions? No, that's the frustrating thing. How could anyone in the Psychonauts do this? And how could they keep it a secret? Maybe he just hatched this scheme on his own? He has no motivation. Oh, hello, Dad. Someone hired him, and, given his access to Truman, someone on the inside. So you can see that you don't learn anything new, but you do get a good sense of the flavor of the characters and you feel like they exist for a while. It's great. Now, this is a break from a more ordinary method of hunting around like this, where you're looking to grab whatever you can find. We'll talk about that in a second, but just to show you, there is another character right over here, Mia. Unfortunately, there is an audio glitch where she's considered to be in the same sound zone, so we're going to constantly hear the interrogation while we talk to her but we can also talk time, uh, to her I always have time for my kid in genio. and again we don't really learn anything nothing of any value at any rate but we do get to uh, be reminded of the things that meditating? we would either already know or would I find out shortly to detect ripples in the psychic network around the world what are you doing that for I'm trying to find the illusionist activity around the world and report it to Agent Foresight down in the nerve center. So we're reminded that the illusionists exist, we're reminded that Agent Foresight exists, we're reminded that the nerve center exists. Now, there is one problem with this. Well, I'll stop Agent Foresight is not in the nerve center. This is actually a more serious problem than you might expect because we are supposed to report to Agent Foresight for our next mission objective. And we're being told that she is in the nerve center, which we don't have access to. That's fortunately not true. She's, uh, she's in her office, which is on the exact opposite side of this um, horseshoe. But I was really confused as to how to get to Agent Forsyth after being explicitly told that she was in the nerve center, which is where she spends all of her time after this plot point. Either way, when we're running around in the open world, usually our gaze is attracted to shinies like this. But there are a few other modes. Rather than just hopping from shiny to shiny, there's a couple of other ways to engage with the world, and one of them is through clairvoyance. I really enjoy clairvoyance because it tells you what they think of you. Now, some people also have secondary things, like, for example, this guy knows where some loot is. That's really not very important. It's just more titanium. Um, to me, the more important thing is that you can really get a sense of what people think about you. And all of the agents around here still think that we're a mole. If we were to go over and look at how we look to him... Oh, look at that. We're a younger version of himself. This is a small but very powerful way to think about things, and I really, really love seeing all of these details. This is one of the things that Psychonauts 1 did really exquisitely, because if you went into someone's brain, you would be transformed into someone else, like Gogalore, whatever they thought you would be. That doesn't really happen in this game, but you can still get a sense of who you are to them by looking at them with the power of your mind. So we have to talk to Sasha. Or not Sasha. Um, I want my this lady. You know Norma. You're right. I'm actually not a fan of Norma. Her design is a little bit weak. 
This looks like a good Now, uh, her point in the game is that she is the conniving one. She's the one that really is just the worst yeah, possible kind of human. Uh, to the point where she almost destroys the planet. Because she just wants to be a bitch to you. And uh, earn some brownie points by doing so. And boy, does that backfire. But that's not what I don't like about her. What I don't like about her is that she is the weakest design of the interns. The other interns all have pretty good designs. For example, here's another intern. Let's see what she thinks about us. Hey, War you should see a doctor. You're looking tippy. So let's talk to Sam, see what she has to say. This is a minor talking thing. This isn't actually like a dialogue tree, it's just a beat. But it's still the same kind of category. It's a dialogue rather than us hunting for shinies. Hey Sam, aren't you not supposed to tap the glass? No, it's the opposite. You're supposed to tap on the glass to keep their heart rates up. In this predator-free environment, their heart rates get dangerously slow. Huh. Plus, they love it. I mean, look at him jump. <laughs> so, when we compare that kind of dialogue to, say, this kind of dialogue... Oh, I can't even talk to him. <laughs> well, that's definitely going to be a bad comparison. <coughs> Excuse me. If we compare that kind of dialogue to this kind of dialogue... This kind of dialogue? Someone talk to me! That person's aura is telling me their there. perspective. Hi! Huh? Basically, what I'm trying to get at is that when you talk to someone and there's no camera cut, that's a different category of interaction than when you talk to somebody and there's a cutscene. That is not a small difference. That's a pretty significant change in how you view the world. So, if you are, you know, hunting down shinies like this... Attention all interns. And then you go and you talk to somebody, there's a big difference in your mode, your mental mode, between talking to somebody and having a cutscene, and talking to somebody and not having a cutscene. We're still in shiny hunting mode right now, because there was no cutscene to that dialogue. That's something that I really want to hammer home here. There are lots of different modes to how we can interact with the world, and one of those modes is to change over to cutscenes or change over to viewing someone through someone else's eyes, like this. This is actually a setup for a really mild joke later, um, which we won't really care about, but... Uh, these are, you know, the more, the more modes you have when you're exploring an open world, the more interesting it can be, because you can switch between the various modes and keep from getting bored. There's also gymnastic modes. We can try and get up there, for example, or stuff like that. And that would be another mode where we would be in. We wouldn't just be shiny. We wouldn't be hunting shinies. We would be aiming to try and climb to the highest peak or find something that we hadn't seen before. All of these concerns are wrapped together pretty well in this game. They're not all evident here in this one location. But over the course of the game, we are going to see a lot of different kinds of exploration, and I really enjoy it. Now let's talk a little bit about stats. Numbers go up is an important part of a lot of games, and this game is one of them. Uh, this is very much a numbers go up kind of game. We have a couple of different ways of making numbers go up. Uh, one way is by using our level up ability. As we gain ranks, we have the ability to spend those ranks on powering up our abilities. Now, these power-ups don't normally just give us, like, plus 5% damage or anything. Usually the power-ups are pretty significant. For example, here in Levitation, we just got a Wrecking Ball power, which allows us to roll over the enemies. And we can, shortly, get a Pouncy Ball power, which actually allows us to make jumps that we would not normally be able to make. All of the powers are like this. The upgrades are not just, you know, plus 5%. They're all pretty significant. Um, this one is the exception, I guess. <laughs> Here, for example, we can learn how to dodge after attacking and all that jazz, or attack after dodging and all that jazz. This is... These are fundamental power-ups, and that's nice. I much prefer those to just getting, like, plus 5% uh, here or there on the stats. In addition to leveling up like that, we also have automatics here. Auto will send us on a tutorial where we have to learn how to level up via combining side these side challenge markers. It's just a tutorial. 
Um, so we're going to skip past it, and then we're going to go in here and do the tutorial here. So this is basically just a shop, right? This shop allows us to level up using partial level ups, which is, you know, the cards that we find floating around. Uh, over here, we've got items, which are which are mostly just candies to restore health. You won't need these for the most part if you know how the fights go. There are a couple of bosses that are a little bit tough without them. But because you don't actually need them if you're decent at fights, you're going to have a ton of spare tit titanium because you're given enough titanium to support a, uh, a debilitating candy addiction, but you never actually need it. We're going to buy a wallet. Which, if you look up at these, uh, uh, up at the top of the screen, it says 100 out of 100. We actually can't get any more Citanium right now, and that's what it's been complaining about as we've been picking up Citanium. It keeps saying, you should visit the, the shop and upgrade. That's their, one of their ways that they're forcing you to try Elephant. and engage with the shop. Looks. We can now store 1,000 Citanium instead of 100. This is all numbers go up shit, but the biggest numbers go up shit is over here in the pins. We can equip three pins at a time, and the pins, there's quite a variety of them. This isn't even all of them. There's more that we can't see yet because we don't have all the powers yet. Some of the pins are just for fun. Some of the pins are pretty significant. Uh, for example, there is a pin that makes time speed up. Um, there is a pin that makes your fireballs focus entirely on you. There's a lot of stuff that you can get from these pins, and it's not usually just, you know, plus 5% damage or anything. Usually it's a little bit more significant than that. The reason I keep harping on that non-statistical side, the fact that it's not just plus 5%, is because there is a lot of freedom to customize exactly what your approach is over the course of the game. If you uh, want to play as a pyrokinetic centric power, uh, you know, pyro pyrokinetic centric uh, combatant, you're going to get these pyro pins and you're going to really love them. And of course, as you rank up, you'll focus most of your rank up points on your pyrokinesis. So it feels like you'll be able to really customize your approach. But that's not actually true. It feels like that, which is probably good enough. But in practice, you have more than enough resources to get every option. Which means that you don't really have to choose how you want to proceed. You're going to be able to get every badge that is available at your level. You're going to be able to get all of the upgrades that you're ever going to want in your level up um, menu here. You're not really going to have to make any choices on which direction to go. You're just going to be making a choice as to what you want to do right now and what you want to do in half an hour. I honestly think that's not a bad approach. That approach allows you to have a little bit of freedom, a little bit of impulse, without actually needing to design the entire game with 19 different approaches for each kind of character. All of these things combined make exploring the world uh, in free room like this pretty entertaining. There are some downsides to exploring the world in free roam, uh, especially in the early game. One of the big problems is that you get yelled at constantly, which I cannot tell you how much that bothered me the first time I played. Um, your, your boss is constantly harassing you to report to her office, and yet they tell you that she's here. They explicitly told me she was here. She's not in here. So I spent like half an hour trying to get in there. Granted? Granted? I can go into the nerve center? I actually didn't realize I could do this yet. Interesting. Oh, wow! This is the nerve center. Where they track psychic activity and operations around the world. I can't believe they let me in here. Yeah, neither can I. But we actually don't have uh, the character we need in here. We were told she was in here, but she's not here. She's in her office, which is somewhere else. So uh, this is is um, something we'll talk about later. This this location, but uh, for now, let's just go back outside and uh, basically finish off the uh, the whole shebang here, the whole episode. Uh, that that really caught me off guard. I didn't realize you could go in there yet, uh, but she's not in there, so that's not where we we go to find her. Um, 
Yeah, so exploring the the world in a free roam sort of setting is a lot of fun. One of the biggest problems it has, though, is the asymmetric way that it can progress. Like, there was a character bit out here where Lily was talking to an agent, and we didn't get to see it because we went and we did a different thing first. It, that just ratcheted everything forward, and it made all of those beats go away because it's all chapter-based, right? So when we went from chapter zero to chapter one, we cleared away the cutscene that was set to happen right here. We never got to see it. Now the cutscene wasn't critical, but it was about how Lily wasn't being allowed to see her dad, which is kind of not minor. That's pretty important, especially given that Lily is supposed to be the most important character in the game to us. It's really important that we really get to connect to her. Now they tried very hard to make sure that I wouldn't miss it. Uh, after all, I, I literally spawn in right here when I first enter the room, staring straight at her. You can only miss it if you decide you don't want to talk to her, which is what I did, because I wanted to run around and talk about other things instead. Still, because of that asymmetric ratcheting, there are scenes you can miss, like permanently. And that's also true of collectibles. Inside of people's brains and stuff, there are plenty of collectibles that you only get one chance to get. And then if you don't get them, you can never collect them. And so in both cases, what they do is they just assume you did it. So if you miss collectibles when you have your one chance to collect them, they just mark them as collected. And if you miss these cutscenes where you could have learned something or interacted with someone, they just assume you did. That's not an ideal solution. Um, I don't know what an ideal solution would be for this kind of game. It's on some pretty tight rails despite being pretty open world. Anyway, we'll talk more about the, the topological open-worldness of it some other time. For now, I think it's uh, about time that we actually go do intern stuff and uh, talk to our new boss. Please report to my office for orientation. I don't have all day, new kid. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll do that next episode.